as much as I can, giving kind of an overview talk based on some of the things I've heard already at this, at this meeting and other meetings, kind of trying to focus a little bit on where I see kind of the needs in terms of uh, you know, machine learning in this uh, sort of multi-messenger environment. So, but to start out, um, I don't think it will surprise anyone to say that, you know, there's this huge technical ecosystem that's being built. Um, and when I say sort of technical eco ecosystem, what I mean is, um, and we'll hear, you know, talks about this during this workshop, but, uh, you know, astrophysical modeling, right? So this, this not only includes the, the folks who are doing like numerical relativity for the gravitation waves, but also those who are thinking hard about the electromagnetic signatures, gamma ray burst, kilonovi, so on from these neutron star mergers. And of course, closely tied to that is the dedicated instrumentation we're using to search for these, you know, gravitation waves, right? So for example, we, so of course we have LIGO Virgo Cagra, but also, you know, the other observatories, say, you know, Ice Cube doing neutrino searches, Ice Cube and Dune, you know, Rubin and ZTF doing, uh, you know, optical time domain surveys. And it's really when you bring both of these, let's say, overall fields together, right, the, the theorists with the experimentalists, into some sort of, you know, overall framework where you combine these together, that's really where science comes out, right? And so what's kind of cool is that, you know, this multi-messenger science that we're working on, it really includes representation from you know, many of the most interesting experiments um, and, you know, theoretical models today. Yes. Oh, okay. Whew. I, back at Minnesota, I still lecture with this thing on, so this is what I'm, what I'm used to doing. Um, okay, so, uh, anyways, to continue, um, we're, we're very quickly arriving at an era where we're, going to, where we're going to be having many, many gravitation wave detections, right? And so I stole this, um, this sort of plot concept from Jonah Kanner um, and sort of updated a little bit with the, the rates that we have from the O3 GWTC3 catalog. Um, but sort of on the, over here, we're kind of in the O3-ish era. Here's kind of O4, here's kind of O5. Um, and it's, it's very exciting, right? So right now we're kind of in the, you know, handful of binary neutron star mergers, you know, handful of neutron star black hole mergers, sort of order 100 binary black hole mergers. But, you know, by the time, you know, 04 and 05 passes, you know, we could be at, you know, many tens of binary neutron star mergers, many tens of neutron star black hole mergers, you know, thousands of binary black hole mergers, right? And so the point here is that the technology we're building to both do our gravitation wave detection, inference, and then go on and do the follow-up, what worked kind of over here with where we're, at, where we're at kind of a couple of detections is for sure not going to work when we're at the, in this 05 era. And so, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking now about the ways that we're going we're gonna to be doing this stuff. And so to provide, you know, some further context, um, so this, this is a plot uh, that is composed of our, mostly of our detections from O3. And so the way to read this is luminosity distance on the y-axis. And in this case, it was sort of, you know, actual time on the x-axis. And colored in, um, and in the colors here, we have, uh, uh, Green is our binary black hole mergers, red is our neutron star black hole mergers, blue is our binary neutron star mergers. And the larger the circle you have, the, okay, it's gonna drive me nuts. Okay, let's see. Sorry about that. This is, my, my slack is just blowing up. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the, uh, and the larger the circle you have, the smaller the sky area you have, right? So the, the ideal signal here for gravitational follow-up is both low on the y-axis and has a large circle, right? And so you'll notice that GW170817 plus two years here stands out relative to anything that we saw during 03, right? So this 
in almost every way this one event that you know has been incredibly useful science-wise and sort of sort of shaped some of the ways that we've been thinking about doing technology development is utterly remarkable and totally not what uh, is consistent with the population that we should be expecting and building for, right? And so the the way that we should be looking at this is that the vast majority of the events that we have will be far away. They'll be near the edge of our detection volume, obviously, as detections are growing as R cubed, right? And many of the sky areas that will require, be required for you know, covering will tend to be very large, right? There are, a few, there are just a few kind of, there are a few examples from 03, say the, what amounted to a binary black hole merger, S190814. Um, but otherwise, you know, most of the signals were, you know, results in very large sky localization. So this is, this is what we need to be building ourselves for looking ahead in these observing runs. Okay, so overall, what's the problem, right? Um, fundamentally, there's this really long road that we go from data to science, right? And so we have gravitation wave strain with the gravitation wave detectors. We clean the data, we calibrate it. We're going to be hearing about all of this at the workshop, of course. Um, we, you know, we do gravitation wave detection. Then we localize the signals. We classify them as by neutron star, neutron star black hole, so on. We issue alerts that inform the gravitation or the broader community that we've detected a signal. But from there, then we have follow-up, right? And so I'm a, you know, sort of optical astronomer by trade, and so um, typically the way this has worked, at least during 03, is you have a mix of uh, astronomers using kind of wide fields of view surveys, think uh, ZTF, PanSTARS, Rubin Observatory. You also have folks doing kind of galaxy targeted searches. This is convenient because uh, the gravitation wave detectors are only sensitive to, you know, a few hundred megaparsecs. Galaxy catalogs are reasonably complete within that volume. So this is kind of a viable strategy you can use as well. But from there then, you get a bunch of candidates, right? Is that still my signal? I am very sorry. I'm going to close my Slack because this is this is just totally insane. Okay. Bad, bad, bad. Okay. Okay, so from there, um, we, get we have to get follow-up photometry and spectroscopy to try to identify the particular candidates. There can be you know, up to hundreds of candidates in the localizations we have in order to at attempt to identify and characterize the transients. Right? So this is a, it's a long road that we go from gravitation waves to GW17817 like, like science. And luckily, there's been a ton of efforts along this line at, at this conference, right? And so I took, uh, this was not an exhaustive copy and paste session, but this morning I took a little time to look at which talks were mostly talking about cleaning and, uh, you know, data quality issues. We had, you know, we've, we've had talks and we'll have some talks on gravitational wave detection. We will have talks on sort of localization and classification. Deep in particular talk, talked a little bit about data alert products and uh, a little bit how to, you know, classify candidates. Um, but it seems clear to me, at least in my mind, there's, that there's kind of two big questions based on the, the work that's going on the community. One, are we ready to apply all of these machine learning algorithms in real time, right? Can we, can we get to the point where this detection, inference, alert, machine learning based alert product is running in an environment where we are able to produce alerts on the order of seconds for the, the community to, uh, to listen to, right? In that sense, all of the work that's going into cleaning the gravitation wave strain offline is all well and good, but it's not going to help our searches for more kilonovi, right? And the second is, you know, how can we support the blue block better, right? And in many senses, this, is, this, this group that we have here is kind of biased, right? It's mostly gravitation wave astronomers, but I think it's generally true that, you know, our gravitation wave field is ahead of where we're at in terms of the, in the astronomy community, in terms of how we're using machine learning to actually do the various steps that we have to get through here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so are we ready to apply machine learning in real time? Right, so, um, Many of the talks that we have are 
basically taking uh, deep learning models and applying it to, to gravitational wave string, which is awesome, right? And there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pros to using you know deep learning models to do real time inference, right? One, it you know has relatively robust modeling capabilities. It's of course real time compatible. However, there's a number of cons, right? It's very resource intensive. We've always, we're always looking for you know, more GPU arrays to train our models or to apply those models. Uh, those models may require, require frequent updates, right? We've already heard talks about the, the changing data quality um, in the gravitational wave detectors at this conference, which implies that the technology we build needs to be capable of making these frequent updates that we need to, we need to be making. The other thing that really affects us is their effective use generally requires pretty specialized knowledge, right? Software, ha hardware. So I'm thinking, you know, your typical graduate student or even postdoc who are building, um, you know, machine learning model to detect, you know, supernovae, you know, the kind of things we heard yesterday. Um, they may not know how to build a pipeline that's capable of running in real time, right? They know how to do some Python scripting and, you know, maybe produce a TensorFlow model or two or whatever. Um, but actually going from there to something that's going to run in real time and produce alerts, that's, a, you know, it's a, it's a big step up. So that's where inference as a service comes in. So the idea here is there are, there are applications that exist for hosting these trains, train networks and exposing them very, uh, by very standardized APIs. So the idea here is that if I've produced a model with, model with TensorFlow or PyTorch or something and it has, and it's taking in the gravitational wave strain data as so many of them do, you give these sort of inference as a service servers your model and that that server is, is capable of kind of abstracting away the hard part, which is in sense sort of ingesting the data in real time, distributing it to the, the various GPUs or CPU arrays that you have access to and returning the inference um, in real time. And so what's cool about these is that they, they're designed to leverage the kind of hetero heterogeneous computing services that we have available within the LVK and elsewhere, right? Both you know, in the LVK and on the cloud. Right, so these large arrays of GPUs and CPUs, they're designed to send, uh, you know, uh, send chunks of data through your model and, you know, return, return that data. Such that, again, like by, you know, they, they scale to the point where if I give more GPUs, um, you know, I will get my data, I will get my inference back faster. And of course, they tend to be, you know, containerized. Um, they provide some sort of centralized model hosting. Um, so they're really convenient. And so the way that we've been using these, um, so we've been building these inferences as a, as a service servers, um, but within our group, we've been thinking about two key pieces of kind of this, this overall chain here. Um, one is the data cleaning, right? And so uh, we'll hear from um, Gabriele and um, Jenny kind of in terms of, you know, some of the sort of you know, how the instrumental noise is cleaned and that kind of thing. Um, but, so I won't go into too much detail, but of course there are technical environmental noises preventing our detectors from operating or at, their de at their design sensitivity. And of course, um, you know, us and many others have been using machine learning methods to combine information from on-site sensors to predict the detector response and remove that noise, right? So I have some sort of noise coupling. I have my auxiliary sensors as witnesses, and I can use that to clean my, clean my data. The other problem, which again, we've already heard about and you know, we'll hear more about for sure, is while gravitational wave detection is basically solved for Gaussian noise, um, Gauss, gravitational wave data is not Gaussian, right? And so um, there have been many successful machine learning models implemented that have been, have been shown to be capable of both meeting the requirements, the speed requirements for online searches, you know, doing very fast inference, um, while being, also being more robust to, to data transients. And of course, these generally have, you know, some, fall, some shortcomings. For example, they tend to be applied to very short signals, you know, BBHs, because in general, it's easier to train smaller networks. But, um, you know, we have a talk from Jonathan Gare I saw on Thursday or Friday that, you know, that group is making progress on the binary neutron star problem. And so, you know, I don't think that this will be a problem for too long. Okay, so what are we doing within the LVK, right? So, um, so we're in the process of doing two things, right? So we're, we're, we built a, um, a cloud-based um, inference server 
um, where we've uploaded something like a month of O2 data, or O3 data. Um, and we've been showing that we can really use the cloud to use arrays of GPUs to do um, you know, online inference. And we've, we've, done, we've created an end-to-end -end ensemble with both our noise cleaning and our uh, you know, binary black hole detection algorithms um, to cover you know, something like 24 hours of, of data. And uh, uh, we've, already, we've already been expanding this to something like the whole month of data. And we've, been, we've already shown that sort of these containerized versions are really capable of exploiting these, these GPU arrays very efficiently. More interesting though, we've been also doing this online, right? And so uh, we've, been, uh, we, we've shown that we can use deep clean in real time and made that clean strain available to downstream, downstream analyses, including BBH, right? So we've developed a framework where we can pass in in real time data to this, uh, to this server, clean the data, uh, you know, apply the BBH detection um, all on the order of uh, you know, milliseconds. So we have, we have faced some, some challenges here, which has been interesting. Um, so the idea here is that most machine learning models perform in, inference on kind of fixed length snapshots of time series, right? I take chunks of data, I train on chunks of data, and then I apply those, and I create a machine learning model that takes in a chunk of data and puts out um, some kind of data product at the end. And so when you run in real time, there's this kind of windowing challenge, right? Because I have all of this, I, you, know, I, you know, within LIGO, we usually do something like 50% overlaps between segments, things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, this has been a challenge to overcome when to understand what is the, the proper kind of overlap to have um, to uh, sort of, let's say, um, maximize, maximize the throughput of your model, right? I would like to have um, as little overlap as possible because, you know, if I have substantial data overlap, you get basically, you know, redundant analyses going on all the time. Um, right, and so the, the um, where we've seen this come up and it's been kind of interesting, uh, we've, been, we've been finding that we have what amounts to some kind of aggregation latency, right? So if I was just to apply my data to all of the data um, up to the end of one segment, um, in, 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 in a sense, the big difference between kind of online and offline searches is whether your search is causal or acausal or not, right? Where I can see data in the future or not. And so one of the, one of the challenges we've had is um, we can't actually go to true real time because, uh, because the data is not available from the future, the machine learning model kind of fails at the very edges of segments. And so actually, we've been able to go to kind of something like half a second, quarter second of latency, um, where because of the fact that we get this, you know, segment quality degradation due to the kind of the acausal nature of these real time searches. So that's been kind of interesting. Right, so um, as I mentioned, we've been, we've been doing this offline as well. So it's a little hard to see in this plot, but gray over here, so this is a log scale. So this is uh, kind of instances of the model we've had and um, uh, uh, time to run. Um, and so on the LDG, uh, on just some kind of, just some single GPU, um, we're up at you know, many tens of milliseconds, something like that. When we go to the cloud using the inference as a service model, you know, one uh, relatively large beefy set of CPUs, we can already beat sort of one LDG G GPU. But then as we, as we go to sort of you know, as a service GPUs, um, you know, red is one, blue is two, green is four, um, uh, yellow is eight. We've gained something like two orders of magnitude in terms of processing time just by going to this inference as a service model. The idea being that it takes care of the sort of you know passing the different chunks of data to these various GPUs above and beyond what's possible in kind of a single throughput um, analysis. And so it's been um, it's really changing the the way we think about how fast you know how fast we can really do things. Right. So um, this is. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think it's a little technical, so let's, let's move on for time. 
Okay, so the, um, the final point I wanted to make, um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing has been in the cloud. Um, we have ordered um, a dedica dedicated array of GPUs for both Hanford and Livingston, and we expect to deploy these before 04. Um, but there's this, uh, but of course the cloud provides basically as many GPUs as you'd like, um, and we've been able to show that in, you know, in a very realistic environment, we've been uploading the, the data from CIT up to the cloud, um, and uh, we've been able to basically sus sustain processing for this whole deep clean, uh, uh, you know, BBH net cleaning detection algorithm, um, you know, using, in this case, uh, four GPUs, um, you know, for, and in this case, we, we ran it for 20 minutes because, you know, we only have so many cloud, you know, Google, uh, Google cr cloud credits. Um, but um, anyways, my point here is that uh, there's infrastructure now that solves much of the, the pain that comes with actually trying to apply these um, these analyses in real time and actually can exploit this, you know, growing environment where we may have, you know, many CPUs, many GPUs available either at CIT or, or in the cloud. And um, if you're running one of these analyses, please come talk to us because we're very interested in seeing them, um, seeing them run. Okay, so sort of the second half of my talk is um, talking about, you know, sort of the, the, the follow-up stuff. And so to, to give folks kind of an overview of the observational landscape, right? So over here on the left, we have our, our what I will call um, sort of provider of multi-messenger alerts, right? So here we have IceCube, we have the LVK. Um, in this case, we have Fermi. Um, you know, we could add many other, uh, um, many other experiments to this. I am very biased working on ZTF, but you could put in, you know, Rubin, Panstars, any other sort of transient finder in this list. But then from there, you, you have either photometric or spectroscopic classification facilities to try to classify or characterize the various objects you have. And then usually you have some sort of large aperture, kind of eight to 10 meter class telescope to, uh, to get a you know, deep, you know, deep imaging or deep spectra for the various objects you have. And so to sort of go into sort of the view of the current optical time domain, um, there's a variety of imagers that um, are sort of, well, one, taking often taking data every night in sort of survey, survey mode, and many of these are also participating in the gravitational wave follow-up game. The, the northern sky in particular is well covered these days. So you have Atlas, which is, um, uh, which is on Haleakala and on Hawaii. Um, you have ZTF, which is on Palomar in California, PanStars, which is also in Hawaii, going down to something like 20, 21st magnitude every couple of nights or so. Um, now down in the south, uh, we, you will have black gem, um, which is you know, going to be kind of similar sensitivity to ZTF. And of course you have Rubin or LSST, which is expected to become fully operational in a couple of years. Um, but the, uh, this is still a challenging problem, right? So I have all of these photometric surveys, but how do I actually understand what the object is that's in my survey, right? So the, the two different approaches basically go, you know, I detect it photometrically and then I, um, then I follow up the object spectroscopically. This really works for surveys which are kind of shallow, down to 20th magnitude or so. Um, we are currently putting a low resolution spectrograph on the Kitt Peak 2.1 meter and I'm claiming that we can get down to maybe 19 and a half or so with that, right? That's a two meter class telescope, right? That's sort of the upper end of something that's relatively available. If you have to, if we're gonna talk about going deeper, right, going to four, eight, 10 meter class telescope, availability much less, of, you know, much less common, right? And so the, the, the proposal, you know, so we heard a talk about this yesterday is doing kind of photometric detection followed by multi-band time series. This is convenient because, you know, you in, for example, the Rubin area, you'll have a large sample of relatively faint objects. Um, you'll kind of use statistical analyses to, uh, you know, let's say characterize the populations. And presumably you'll be using some kind of clever technique to try to filter out the handful that you're gonna actually follow up, right? You will not follow up, um, you know, the vast majority of Rubin observatory alerts, but you will write filters to try to identify the handful of objects you care about. And so the, the way that we think about this, um, Within, uh, within ZTF. 
So we have, on the same mountain, we have the 48 inch, um, which has ZTF on it, this 50 square degree imager. We have the 60 square, uh, we have the, the P60, the 60 inch telescope, which currently has the SED machine on it, which is a four channel imager with an integral field unit spectrograph. Um, we are sort of building an improved, upgraded version of this at Pitt Peak that'll go, you know, about a magnitude deeper. Um, and then we have the, the five meter on the mountain that does, that does spectroscopy for us. And so if I was to sort of lay out what I view as the technical landscape for, you know, where, where we sit in kind of astronomy and how this stuff is used, sort of going, going around the, the plot here. Um, so of course we have a variety of visualizations. Many of them are developed kind of within or tangentially to our gravitation wave community. There are these brokers, and the concept of a broker is it takes in alerts from uh, uh, sort of optical surveys, does some filtering of those, um, of that data, maybe some uh, augmentation with, um, you know, data from other surveys, that kind of thing, to try to do some classification, but basically tries to filter that alert stream to, to, per, to reduce the flow to the things that you care about. Um, and these tend to be coupled with various, you know, sort of, ways to, to sort of rapidly do that filtering. Of course, you have a variety of galaxy catalogs this, at this point. Many are publicly available. These, of course, have been very useful for the gravitation wave follow-ups. Kind of tied to the broker concept, you have these marshals. And the idea of a marshal is you're taking that handful of those handful of objects that you care about and uh, doing things like triggering other facilities to get further photometry. Uh, running light curve modeling to get Bayes factors for fits of, um, you know, kilonovia or supernovia or whatever you care about. Um, and then the final thing on the list is the actual scheduling software. So there's, of course, a lot of software out there to, to do network-based um, telescope scheduling at this point, obviously important for the gravitation wave community. Um, and yes. Okay, so and the point I, was, I wanted to make here is actually that machine learning is playing this huge role in a lot of these, in a lot of these areas too, right? So for example, all of this light curve classification work, some of which we heard about deep, you know, uh, is going on within the brokers. You know, within transient filtering, we have things like real bogus to try to identify, um, you know, real transients versus, you know, a CCD art artifact. Within these galaxy catalogs, we have photometric redshifts where instead of getting a, a spectrum, we're, we're, just using, um, we're just using color to try to identify the redshift. Um, these marshals, as I said, are using light curve fitting, and many of them are using machine learning to do so. And within sort of the scheduling framework, there are these oracles um, being built to do kind of optimal augmentation of the data to take your survey, take your follow-up facilities, and, and add to it. And so to sort of um, sort of walk through this process, so wide field follow-up, I have this, this image that I've taken from Leo. Um, and so what you see here is we have an example sky map, and in this case we took a ZTF-like imager, um, and you can see the, um, the images being taken on the sky here as you go, and um, you have some sort of cadence that you know, presumably is designed such that uh, you can identify fading counterparts by you know, observing the same part of the sky hours later, things like that. Um, but the, yeah, what, please. What, what does the shade mean? Like, why are they some darker and some of them lighter? Oh, we had it, we had it fade as uh, some kind of exponential since the time it was taken or something like that. So then you can see, like, if I, if I was to play this, sorry, good. The most recent observations versus the old observations. Yeah, right. And so if I... If I let this movie go longer, then you eventually see that these ones get re-imaged again, you know, and they're like white. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, but I'll leave Leo for, for his scheduling talk. Um, but, uh, you know, just as important, um, the, you know, like doing telescope scheduling, um, there's, a, there's a variety of things that we can be doing to support the, the observing community um, when it comes to making sensible choices with the data that we produce, right? And so this, when I say observing scenario here, I generally mean, you know, large-scale simulation studies where we, where we simulate both, you know, all the way from the gravitational strain and the detections with the power spectral densities our detectors have through kind of the detection and localization steps, through the data products that we're putting out within the alerts, such that the community can go about and 
actually um, plan for something like 04 with you know realistic um, kind of realistic scenarios. And you know, I'd, I'll highlight you know one of my um, one of my RU students with um, along with Leo Singer. We just put out such a public data set where we where we actually went back to the um, to look at the public alerts during 03. Um, we used SNR thresholds that were appropriate for the various pipelines that we have. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and uh, we we put on Zenodo a you know a, you know ten thousand sky maps by neutron stars, neutron star black holes, binary black holes for the community to use, right? And so it's stuff like this that we within the collaboration need to be doing to help inform the community how they how they should be spending their time. Right, so I mentioned this optimal augmentation stuff, right? So, you know, what do we do once we've gotten to the point where we've had our wide field of view surveys trigger their observations, right? So we've, this is usually the point that people kind of stop thinking, right? They're like, I've triggered, I've triggered my telescope, probably have found something, you know, and hopefully it's good, right? That's sort of where the gravitational wave community stops, but in actuality, that's where all the work is, right? I mean, nowadays we've, we've solved a lot of this, now this is actually the hard part, right? So as Deep you know, pointed out yesterday, right? Often a photometric light curve is really all you have available to classify it. Due to the fact that there, we have so many follow-up systems available, you, we really desire to design a system that can you know, optimize how to differentiate between models for kilonovae or gamma ray burst afterglows with all the other fast transients that are out there, right? When we do serendipitous kilonovae surfaces, we find you know, M dwarf flares, we find relatively fast fading supernovae, shock breakout, that kind of thing. And so um, you know, we, we're still learning to identify kilonovae from all the other kind of fast temporal evolution stuff. We're not worried about supernovae anymore. We can identify supernovae, it's not a problem, right? But the, it's the other stuff that is, is a real pain. And so, in principle, we should be using our, these machine learning to kind of sp speed up inference on potential counterparts. Um, in particular, when we're trying to combine the gravitation wave and the electromagnetic um, information together. So, to give sort of a background in how this stuff works now, um, and to sort of show the point that sort of this optical survey is just where we start. Um, so, this this is where we're at with our data. Right, we're on the very top left hand side here. Um, in our case, the, the way that we do this is we, we have a very simple check for whether our object is fading quickly or not. Kilonovae fade quickly. It's one benefit that we have um, to, to differentiate it from most of the other transients that we have out there, right? I can get rid of my supernovae with this. I don't need fancy photometric classifiers to do that, right? Uh, however, the, what happens next, right, is um, for example, you have to go back in time and trigger, when I say trigger force photometry, what I mean is I have a detection now, I think it might be a new object, I go back in time and look at that position in the survey going back in time, kind of two, three sigma detections to find out is it actually as new as I think it is. Um, and if it is new, right, I mean we can do a few things. One, we can sort of fit it to our fast, the various fast transient models we have. We basically check, is this thing fading at a rate that's consistent with a kilonova? Is it potentially reddening in a way that's interesting? So we can check for things like that. But the more important thing is triggering the follow-up, right? I need to get more photometric data than I have on hand with a ZTF-like cadence at the very least in order to ever hope to confirm that something's you know, a kilonova or not. And so, of course, we have, we've built these triggering platforms, um, which we can talk about separately, to, to trigger all sorts of systems through APIs at this point, right? So a lot of the work is you know, building this sort of infrastructure to get to the point where we have this feedback loop where we can get, where we can get new data, we can refit it to models and that kind of thing, right? So you know, it's a lot more than just sort of point and shoot. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, why do we want fr fancy strategies, right? So kilonovae have pluses and minuses, right? So um, most supernovae um, are very bright and fade relatively slowly, right? And so, um, you know, we have luminosity basically on the y-axis, time from peak on the x-axis. Um, and, you know, kilonovae stand out, right? They are underluminous and they fade quickly. This is great, right? They don't look like supernovae. This is also bad because they're underluminous and fade quickly. That's why they're hard to find. More uh, kind of trickier is the fact that they redden, right? So we have this R-process nucleosynthesis, these high opacities that are being cr created. 
And uh, unlike supernovae, these, these, these objects are fading or are um, reddening really, really quickly. Not so important for this talk, but this is why near infrared um, point and shoot follow up being part of kind of the regular routine is, is basically essential and really informs the kind of instruments you want to be building to do um, gravitational wave follow up. Okay, so, so what are we doing, right? Um, so we have this, uh, uh, um, we're building what we call um, an oracle, and I always screw up um, its name, but the, the idea for these things is uh, instead of um, at the end of this pipeline kind of looking at a light curve and you know, sort of rank ordering it by how well it fits a kilonova light curve and then just sort of randomly triggering photometry, you actually let ma a machine learning pipeline do value-driven follow-up, right? Where um, the idea here is that using, uh, um, using a mix of machine learning and Bayesian inference, you are augmenting the photometry that you have from this case, we applied it mostly to type 1a supernovae, but we're doing it for kilonovae, and asking how well can I constrain uh, the ejecta masses of my kilonova? How well can I constrain the inclination angle? Instead of just randomly pointing and shooting, right? So this is, this is the goal here, right? And so, um, uh, as I said, we've been doing this for supernovae. Um, ZTF on its own is basically a supernova survey. It comes back every couple of nights or so. It's perfect for these fast fading objects. But even with that, we've already been showing that um, by making optimal choices with, um, with this oracle, we're getting something like 10 to 20% improvement in, in this case, supernova parameters, basically you know, peak brightness and um, some kind of uh, width parameter that you know, we can do you know, standardization with. Um, but the, the idea here is not hard, right? For, for, su for supernovae, you're basically filling in gaps. You're mostly resolving phases that have relatively high variability, mostly looking kind of in peaks and value, valleys. So, you know, nothing here is, um, it, the, the choices being made are not surprising, but the, the fact that it's, you know, has, you have an automated algorithm to do this is what's, what's so powerful. Okay, so, so what then, right? So imagine I've, I've gone through this whole work. I have this sort of, you know, automated um, observational capabilities, how, how do we get to the point where we're, where we're sort of using the, the information from the gravitation waves to inform how we're identifying and characterizing counterparts? And so we've been building um, this infrastructure that we call NMMA, which is this nuclear multi-messenger astrophysics framework, which is a fully Bayesian joint inference pipeline. It does gravitation wave data analysis, it does kilonova modeling, it does gamma ray gamma burst afterglow flitting. It also has contributions from the nuclear, um, theoretical nuclear community providing um, neutron star equation of states that are consistent with chiral effective field theory and so on. Um, it also incorporates um, observations from other facilities, say NICER doing um, pulsar fitting. Um, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for everything you need EMGW. And in addition to sort of working as a 72817 analyzer, we're of course then using it as a way to, to help us identify counterparts, right? Um, so to give a um, sort of my one screenshot of a corner plot that'll show in this whole thing, um, what I think is so cool about this kilonova field in general, it's hard to see, I know, but the left two parameters here are um, mass ejecta from your kilonova, the kilonova components, so you're doing uh, uh, sort of astrophysics, our process, nuclear physics, nuclear synthesis physics. Um, but we also have some equation, equation of state parameters. Lambda tilde is a tidal deformability. MTOV is a maximum mass of a neutron star. And some kind of extr in extrinsic parameters, which allows you to do h naught, Abel constant stuff, inclination, angle, distance, and so on. Right. So in one corner plot, you're doing three pretty different areas of physics, which is pretty remarkable. Right. And so the, the benefit here is you're extracting, extracting science and potentially doing filtering, right? I'm, I'm a big proponent of as much as possible. We should be, we should be using the same software to do uh, transient filtering as well as you know, the final science papers at the end. But it's really cool because uh, from, from this one pipeline, you extract information on all these various areas of physics, right? So it's, it's this it's kind of remarkable um, field. 
And so as I mentioned, so as of now, we're, we're, we're doing this online. So we, we do these online Kilanova surveys um, with, with ZTF. We do this every night. Kilanovi fade fast. You cannot find Kilanovi in late times. It's a total waste of time. You will never know what you have. I have a bunch of objects within ZTF from early on in ZTF where they're fast fading, and I'll never know what it is, right? I don't have a spectrum of it. I, don't, I can't see it reddened because I have like two filters. Like it's just a total waste. And so um, we've made this huge effort to do everything online where we fit all of our candidates to Kilanova, GRB Afterglow, Supernova, Sopernovi, so on models, um, get Bayes factors out and then trigger follow-up based on what's here. And so we have a little Slack channel that we use for this, but um, one of our, we're, we're, we're in the process of integrating this with, with the marshals that we use within ZTF to, to bring this online for 04. And I'll also point out, and you know, I give deep a shout out here too, um, you know, the work that's ongoing is also gonna inevitably improve the community follow-up. So um, we are in the process of using NMMA based on the low latency gravitation wave templates to predict what the light curves should be to put them out in the alert packets. Basically, I know from the gravitation wave information what I think the object should look like that I should be looking for, great. And then I can, of course, then use that when I do my candidate light curve fitting. Great, right? I mean, that's exactly what I want. And so um, we have a graduate student and an undergraduate student here who, with the help of Deep, are in the process of um, putting this into some of the low latency code we have within the LVK um, to try to do this. Um, and so again, it's kind of this, this one-stop shop um, combining information. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, um, so I am one of the co-PIs for one of these new data science institutes um, that's focused on machine learning. In our case, uh, we, uh, we are planning on um, bringing sort of uh, machine learning and associated dedicated hardware development, think GPUs, FPGAs, ASICs, that kind of thing, to the domain science community, neuroscience, high energy physics, and astronomy, right? And so I'm, I'm one of the leads for astronomy. Um, we have a number of calls every week that we'd, that we'd very much love to have people come to. Um, I run a call at 9 a.m. Central on Mondays. Everyone's invited on all things kind of technical MMA. If you are doing light curves or if you're doing telescope triggering or you're doing sort of, uh, you know, this alert packet stuff, please come talk to us. We'd love to have you. We have a series of meetings um, that focus more on the gravitational wave ML. A Friday, our Friday meetings kind of, you know, inference as a service. So if you have, you know, if you have ML pipelines you want to run in real time, this is where you come and talk to us. Um, we have a CAGRA focused meeting. The CAGRA folks have been really excited about this. So we meet with them every week on, on Thursdays. And then we have kind of a ML detection meeting on Tuesdays. So um, love to have you. Um, a lot of people here we'd love to have. So, so please, please consider joining us. OK, so to, to summarize, I hope I'm not way over time. Um, so, I, so inference as a service. I, I think it's, it's, it's already showing itself to be a really relatively powerful way to bring deep learning to bear in our sort of gravitational wave astronomy context. Um, you know, it, we've shown that uh, deploying one of these pipelines enables us to, to use these big computing arrays that we have access to incredibly efficiently. Um, and I, and it's, we've, we've already applied it with a number of our sort of in-house you know, ML algorithms, please come to us to, because some of you have much cooler stuff going on, like the inference people or whatever, please come talk to us. We'd, we'd love to have you, you working with us. Um, for the ML-based follow-up, um, it's exciting um, because, uh, I, I kid you not, during 03, it'd be like 3 a.m. and we'd just be randomly targeting, you know, the top 10 candidates we had on our list. It was just it was a total nightmare, right? So moving towards these ML algorithm-based optical optimal augmentation techniques is, will be a huge step up over what happened during 03. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, if you're interested, we're in the process of making sort of Kilanova MDCs and that whole thing to, to create this based on CTF. So please join us. Um, and sort of finally, you know, things that I'm excited about, um, you know, can we, can we take the, the detection in PE going on with the, the, the BBH signals predominantly and bring them to BNS signals? To be honest, I'm, I don't care at all about BBHs. I'm embarrassed to say that as LVK member, but I just don't, right? And so um, everything we've talked about really only matters if there's a neutron star involved, which means long signals. And so uh, I, 
I, I do hope people are really working on this. Um, uh, you know, I'm also excited, right? I think it's clear that machine learning may be one of the keys to improving the way that we do follow-up and, um, you know, classification. And potentially down the line, right? You know, I mentioned NMMA, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's maybe even a talk at this conference on sort of using ML as a overall MMA pipeline, kind of going at the image level and that kind of thing. And so is that ultimately the key for doing, you know, it all in one place? So this is kind of where things that I'm excited about. And otherwise, I will say thank you and thanks.